Very warm welcome to each one of you. Thank you for being in time on day two. We will commence with the proceeding in about 10 to 12 minutes from now. Meanwhile, may I request everybody to be seated, be comfortable, and all mobile phones either switched off or put on to silent mode from onwards, please. Thank you. A very warm welcome to all our special invitees, eminent speakers and panelists, senior officials, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, to day two of the 17th FIKI Higher Education Summit 2022, which is being organized by FIKI in support with the Ministry of Education, Government of India, and Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday on day one, we had a very enriching experience. Approximately 800 registrations on day one, and day one was graced by some eminent dignitaries, beginning with Dr. Subhash Sarkar, the Honorable Minister of State for Education, Government of India, who inaugurated the summit. And we had special addresses from Mr. Sumit Joshi, Vice Chairman and Managing Director, South Asia for Signify Innovations India, Mr. BVR Subramanyam, former Commerce Secretary, Government of India, and Mr. Sanjay Verma, Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Along with our eminent dignitaries from Academia addressing on the topics of higher education, being higher education system in India, moving towards global competitiveness, developing India as a global higher education hub, and universities the hub of knowledge and tech innovation. And ladies and gentlemen, day one ended with presentation of the eighth FIKI Higher Education Excellence Awards. And we now look forward to day two, where we will have discussions on developing world-class universities, the imperatives, developing world-class faculty, exploring new frontiers of partnerships and networks, and reimagining and redesigning the research ecosystem. And ladies and gentlemen, today we will have a special address by none other than but Mr. Amit Khan, Amitabh Khan, India's G20 Sherpa Government of India. And ladies and gentlemen, we are now all set to begin the first panel discussion session of day two, the panel discussion four, on the topic developing world-class universities, the imperatives. And I have the proud privilege in inviting on stage our uh, distinguished eminent moderator, Mr. Ravi Pachnandan, co-chair FIKI Higher Education Committee and Managing Director and CEO Manipal Global Education Services. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome. I also have the privilege in inviting our eminent panelists. I invite Dr. Ananya Mukherjee, Vice Chancellor, Shivnada University. Let's put our hands together to welcome ma'am. I invite Dr. Munin Shen, Deputy Representative, Taipa Economic and Cultural Center in India. A very warm welcome to you, sir. I invite Professor Dr. Tabriz Ahmed, Vice Chancellor, G.D. Goenka University. I invite Mr. Amitabh Jingan, partner EY Parthenon. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And I also invite Mr. Ratnesh Kumar Jha, CEO India and Southeast Asia, the Burlington Group of Companies. A very warm welcome to you, sir. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, a very warm welcome to the panel discussion session on developing world-class universities, the imperatives, and the time duration for the session is approximately one hour, 15 minutes, which will include the opening and closing remarks by our distinguished moderator. And we have deliberations, addresses, or presentations by all our eminent speakers, which will be followed by the question and answers in the end, if the time permits. And with those words, I now I'll hand over to our moderator, Mr. Ravi Pachnandan, co-chair FIKI Higher Education Committee and Managing Director and CEO Manipal Global Education Services. Over to you, sir. To all of you, we are familiar with the maxim, knowledge is power. But perhaps it's time to conceptualize it uh, more appropriately now more than ever before. As we stand today as one of the one among the eight billion population on the planet, 
it is important to revisit the role of education, especially that of higher education. We consistently hear the term differentiation. So how are we differentiating our, from different people? We also know, or there's been a lot of talk in terms of a differentiation between what we call as a degree and what we define as a competency. Let me elaborate that for a minute. So a degree is what you get when you go to a university. Competency, whether, whether the degree will make you fit for working somewhere, doing research, going for higher education, one is not so sure about it. So the competency, a, there seems to be a gap between competency that is required for a job, that is required for higher education, and a degree. We had 8.2 million graduates in India in 2019-2020 academic year. How many of them were truly competent enough to get a job? Between 2016 and 2020, in the five years, we just moved in 45,000 students to 49,000. So in a span of five years, we have just managed to increase the inflow of students into India by about 3,000, which doesn't speak greatly about what we have in store for them. We also struggle with some of the other levers and we did talk about it yesterday too. For 28 students in our country, there's just one faculty. So the fact, student faculty ratio is 28 is to one. And if you really look at China or if you look at even South Korea, it's, it's in the range of 18 to 21. So we spend about 0.7% of our GDP on R&D which is lower than most of our peers. So if you look at China, China spends about 2.1%, USA 2.8%, Korea 4.2%, Israel 4.3% on R&D. Our contribution to global research and development is 2.7% only, as compared to USA and China, which contributes more than 50%, right? About 0.5% is the enrollment in, the Indian, or in India in doctoral programs. So some of these data, some of these numbers that I'm, I'm throwing out early in the morning at 10.30 are supposed to hit the target. It, it is supposed to tell us that, look, we can, we can dream, it's aspire, whatever we want. But end of the day, the numbers don't speak on our behalf. Yes, our education system has is good. That's why all of us are here. We have all been mostly, mostly been, uh, you know, educated in our own education system. A lot of us have made it. But look at the numbers in comparison. I think the one thing that we need to do more of is benchmark. We need to figure out how do we stack up against global competition? How do we stack up against what others are doing? And is there a lesson for us to learn and quickly replicate in India under our conditions, under the way we design our education? NEP 2020 is off talk talked about, has been spoken about for the last two years. Those, those are in line with our ambitions for 2047 when we celebrate the 100th year of uh, independence. The policies, in a nutshell, have liberated the academia to a certain extent, while enabling possibilities of a larger collaboration with global academia and with both domestic and international companies. A major highlight of NEP is research and the Institute of Eminence. A lot of us in India, me included, often confuse world-class universities with Institute of Eminence. Okay? While there is a link somewhere, it is not the, it is possibly just the beginning of picking some institutes of eminence. Are they world class? What does a world class university mean? How do you define a world class university? If I could just go around the room, I'm sure there'll be many definitions, many hues, many ways how people are going to talk and define world class universities. These are critical to retain our national competitiveness in an ever-integrating and digitizing economy. They are a means for national development and a catalyst for building sustained competitive advantage. They are expected to play key roles in generating and circulating knowledge, educating highly skilled personnel and serving the needs of the society. Do all countries need a need world-class university? Perhaps. Okay. But it is for the government to decide when they want to jump into the initiative and open it up 
the way 2017 is when we we started looking at the Institute of Eminence. South Korea has, as all of you know, KB21, which they launched in 1999. Japan launched its Global Center of Excellence project and top global university in 2014. India opted for a combination of two approaches. There are three approaches broadly which people write about and talk about when they want to define and design a world-class university. The first approach is picking winners approach. So the second is a hybrid one. And the third one is what, what people call as the, uh, you know, starting from scratch, you know, so grounds up, a kind of clean state way is a, is a term they use. So India has gone for a hybrid kind of an approach saying that, look, we will pick winners approach. So existing universities pick through the Institute of Eminence uh, methodology, pick some of them, you know, invest in them, provide support, research support and all of that and see where that goes. And the second one of course is the clean state one, which is like a geo, I mean what they've done with geo, which is completely ground, brownfield, nothing was existing, start from scratch and see where that leads us. So it's, it's good approach and I think we've taken the first step forward in correcting many of the structural challenges that face us today, many of the structural challenges that could pose not just a hurdle for the Institute of Eminence or world-class university, but it could also pose similar hurdles for when we go about actually rolling out NAP 2020, which if you tell, if you ask me, we've just scratched the surface. A lot of people are finding out, figuring out ways of implementing uh, NAP 2020 in the way they understand, in the way they envisage. So very clearly there are hurdles to cross and we made the beginning. So I, I'm, I wish and I, I kind of look forward to how this gets played out as we go along. We've got a fairly uh, eminent panel and the way I'm going to run this session is uh, I'm going to ask them a simple question in the beginning to get them warmed up and get their views, get their definitions, get, get their, you know, so that they get their wireframes in order and picking up from there uh, I'm going to really figure out as to what are the two or three things that this panel can come out with in terms of solution. Uh, I think I've said this before, I think I said this yesterday. Problems we all know about. It's been written about, white papers, it's been discussed ad nauseum in many conferences like this. Solution is what I'm looking for. Solution and what can Fiki do with those solutions. That is more important and that is something that I'm looking forward and that I expect to get out of this panel. So without uh, more ado, let me just introduce my uh, the eminent panels. There's Amitabh Jingen who's from EY. Uh, okay. There's uh, Dr. Munir who's from, we'll, we'll talk about it when we come. Dr. Ananya and uh, we've got Ratnesh from <clears throat> so, <coughs> so can I start off by asking the first question to, and we'll go this round. We'll start with Amitabh because he's the consultant. So let's let's let the consultant have the first word. Let the consultant have the first word. So I'll start with uh, Amitabh first, and then we'll go around the table and come back and see where this goes. What does a world-class university mean to you? How do you how do you define? Uh, what does it signify to you? And can you come out with one or two solutions if you think those are missing in your definition and tell us how you would like uh, the solution to look like? So, uh, thanks uh, Ravi and, and good morning everyone. Well, I think, um, I mean, you know, obviously um, when we think about defining a world-class university, there's, uh, you know, eventually the, the description will gravitate towards rankings, um, you know, global rankings. But I think, um, you know, what, what is perhaps, you know, in my mind, um, you know, important is, especially in the context of a country like India, which is uh, still uh, trying to, you know, um, you know, grow enrollments, grow access, uh, along with, you know, uh, tackling quality. I think we need to unpack, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the metrics that go towards determining global rankings uh, and if I look at just what young universities that have um, you know achieved great success in the last you know over a shorter period of time as compared to some of their uh, more experienced peers have done is really they've they've focused on three or four elements 
of uh, uh, you know uh, what what eventually goes on to make rankings and i think to me that would be you know the more practical approach and when i look at some of these younger universities i think what they've consistently done is you know um, you know uh, addressed uh, very quickly graduate outcomes uh, again you know and, and i think the common theme in all of this is focus on factors focus on metrics that can be controlled by the institution um, you know i you know stuff like research um, international perception there are a lot of um, you know aspects which go towards count towards global rankings which are perhaps outside the control of an institution need time um, and therefore i think we should obviously separate those but you know a lot most successful institutions have focused on you know very high quality graduate outcomes um, you know irrespective of what pathway a graduate chooses um, you know whether it is further education whether it's employment you know taking you know setting targets which are clearly best in class and delivering on those is is one common theme across sort of universities that have done well um, especially in a short period of time um, i think the second important aspect that universities have focused on is put in place very high quality almost world class governance um, the third is higher uh, you know high quality talent across both the academic as well as the non academic functions and i think again in the indian context i think it is very important for us to understand the value and i think for all institutions and stakeholders to understand the value of um, you know the you know how important non academic leadership is uh, you know within a university and then the other two pieces which is you know obviously which are almost um, you know um, supporting uh, this is you know funding which is obviously a lot of this you know all of this stuff costs a lot of money um, and and again i think there needs to be a clear plan uh, you know around funding um, you know and 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 finally uh, again sort of you know you it is possible to um, you know at least um, have a much greater international focus in a short period of time because again these are actions that are controllable by any university so in my mind i think you know just kind of to summarize i think unpack what it takes to what what the conventional measures of um, you know world class or you know uh, globally high ranked universities are focus on items that 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 i think are controllable um, you know by an institution uh, you know and and i think really i think uh, you know execute or, or you know build you know your you know as an institution build your plans which are completely aligned to them with very specific goals that's what you know at least kind of my observation uh, you know what what i've seen you know as a common theme with some successful institutions thanks amita uh, dr mumin chand if i can have your views and uh good morning uh very happy to be here today um i think i'm the only person not indian on this stage right so allow me to uh first spend uh, a few minutes uh, introducing about uh my country taiwan uh, our education yeah because uh, here uh, in this uh, uh education uh, affair we also have a booth here uh taiwan small island uh, with a population and uh, of a 23 million of population uh but uh, we have a right now we have a 160 seven universities including um uh, private universities and uh, public universities uh, so actually it's a huge number and together uh, in taiwan today we have a uh, 1.2 million of the students yeah in all universities among them 1 million are undergraduate and another uh, 200,000 are uh, post graduates um uh, taiwan uh, government and also the society we we devoted a tremendous resources uh, on education in the year 2021 last year uh uh that uh, uh the the total budget for education is a, is a, a 21 billion US dollars which account for around 28% of the entire government budget yeah so um so uh, at least in taiwan that we 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 think that the education is uh, the most important in a way to uh, promote and the development national you know potential yeah okay go back to this a uh, uh, topic of this uh, you know uh, building up a uh, world class universities because uh, before i come here to delhi to work i was uh, also a vice president for international affairs uh, in my university in taiwan i i also taught in universities for uh, 18 years um my every day when i was in taiwan we also asked the same question how can we make ourselves world class 
yeah, and how do we uh, become you know world class universities? Uh, my 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 own answers. Okay, my own answers. I think that of course that uh, people think that investments on you know your software hardware uh, is important. Yeah, if you have no money. Then uh, you cannot get the, the best, uh, you know, researchers. You cannot get the best students. You cannot generate uh, a best research. That's for sure. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that the, the, the most important is that the whether universities has uh, a good policies on, you know, uh, what it will be your development strategies. For instance, my universities uh, uh, in 2018 we celebrate 100 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, among all eight colleges are. Our agriculture and the natural uh, natural resources college is the most uh, most popular and also uh, most prominent. Yeah, so uh, when we when we try to uh, uh, promote our university and we when we try to uh, uh, build up international collaboration, we we think that uh, we have to use our strengths. That is uh, uh, in, uh, on environmental science, yeah, on agriculture, and also uh, related to subjects. That is something that uh, we could show our, you know, advantage and strengths. So this is, uh, I think that uh, this is the first important thing that we have to do. And second, um, after years of uh, teaching in universities, uh, uh, I also feel that uh, uh, a very, very important concept. I think that is uh, 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 now also very popular, uh, not just in Taiwan but also here in India. That is a uh, university social responsibilities. That is uh, what you can do to the societies. Yeah, because, that, uh, of course, uh, your uh, research uh, achievements uh, that uh, 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 will be, you know, uh, will be seen only by the, 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 the people in your field. But uh, how, what you can do to the society, I think it is more important. That is uh, how, uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, a project you can do to help, the, to help the, the, the societies, to help the government, to help the business. So uh, right now in Taiwan and also in many other countries, that uh, uh, university social respons responsibilities become uh, a new and also important indicator, yeah, to to see that uh, uh, the performance of a university. And uh, the third, uh, I also think very very important uh, here in India that uh, I think that many universities also start to you know uh, uh, pay uh, attention. That is uh, your international connections, yeah, uh, uh, which means that. Uh, uh, that uh, not just to recruit the best talents from other countries, but also to uh, have a more research and uh, academic uh, collaborations with other good universities around the world. Yeah, like uh, uh, in my university, uh, we don't have any, and also in Taiwan, we don't have any uh, program on India or South Asia. So how do we, how do we know about India? And how do we uh, 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 do research about South Asia? The best way is to build up a collaboration with the best universities in India. We recruit Indian students and have a research collaboration with the Indian professors and scholars. And uh, in the past, uh, in the past few years, uh, uh, we in Taiwan that the, the number of Indian students uh, uh, in like five eight years it was only like five hundred eight hundred. But right now, 3,000 yeah, Indian full-time students yeah, in, in, in all universities in Taiwan. Of course, this is still uh, a small number, but we hope that uh, the number could double or even triples. So uh, go back to this uh, uh, the, the topic. I think uh, that uh, to build up a world-class universities, uh, the, the most the most important three indicators will be yeah, your research capacity and whether you could have uh, uh, good uh, uh, software and hardware support and uh, uh, how what you can do to achieve or to uh, to contribute to university social resp responsibility and finally build up the credible international uh, 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 connections. Okay. Okay, that's my points. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. I think this was very interesting. I uh, maybe there are some pointers that I, when I spoke about benchmark, is, is something that we can talk about and something that we can pick it pick it up from. Dr. Ananya, what are your views? So I think the question. Sorry, I think the question was what makes what is a world class university. So the first thing I would say to that is a world class university does not shy away from being distinctive. You don't become world-class just by replicating what is already being done. You become world-class by defining how you are different and what you are going to bring to the world 
what nobody else is bringing. And I feel, you know, I have returned to India after 27 years, and I've seen India from outside, and now I'm uh, seeing India from inside. I think we have every ingredient to state and claim our distinctiveness in different spaces, but we have to be focused and bold enough to do that. Um, the second um, uh, b uh, marker of a world-class university is not only graduate outcomes in terms of competence, but also in empowerment. We need to graduate students who are fully empowered. And globally, we see now that students, our youth everywhere, are going through a huge mental health crisis. And this is coming from a sense of disempowerment, which became particularly evident during the COVID crisis. And we absolutely need to have an education system which produces empowerment, the sense of being able to impact society, impact future, impact the future, uh, frame your future, design your future through what you have learned. The second is also a point about impact, but World Class University's research has impact. It fulfills not only social responsibility, but also local responsibility and global responsibility. The final point I would say, and it's, we've, always, uh, we've all talked about the global partnership. Absolutely, a world-class university needs to be a university of the world. But the global relationships have to be equitable. We must engage with confidence, with equity, as partners in an ecosystem where each of us bring our strengths, but none of us are there just to receive something that we don't have. But that sense of true collaboration and ecosystem, and I say that about all collaborations, academia and in industry partnership is extremely important right now for universities to succeed. Those partnerships must also to be and a principle of, of creating an ecosystem. Uh, global partnerships must be in the principle of creating an ecosystem. And those three, the research impact, the creation of empowered citizens through our education, and the fostering of truly equitable partnerships globally, locally, and across sectors, those three are very important markers of, uh, of world-class universities. And of course, being able to define what, where our distinctiveness lies. And in order to make all of this happen, the leadership, the quality of governance and leadership is of course key. I think I will disagree just a little bit on the divide between academic and non-academic. Yes, we need both kinds of um, uh, competence in creating good university leadership, but the academic and the non-academic must be again in a true partnership, not as working in a silo, which is what is happening in universities mostly all over the world. And that bringing together the academic and the non-academic skills is extremely important for creating proper, uh, appropriate university governance for world-class universities. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nandya. Uh, we will come back to you because I think uh, uh, clearly there is a there seems to be a distinction that we need to draw between differentiation and ranking, and how important is ranking for differentiation. So I think that that's a good follow-up uh, question that we will do. But before that, uh, Ratnish, can I have your views? And uh, so I. Uh, let me first uh, actually uh, address the audience by the setup and I was watching uh, the, how is audience in terms of sitting. I see a future youngster sitting behind and I see our partners from Israel, Turkey, Uganda, Taiwan and Australia sitting in between as our mentor or suggest somebody who could actually guide us and I see a very eminent set of academicians sitting in front. So that's a real, real reflection of how uh, uh, India is uh, the diverse country. Uh, I think uh, I work in India and I work whole of Asia, including China, and I see India both inside India and outside India in the contemporary time now. Uh, and my point here uh, is uh, uh, is that for us, uh, 
making that world class university or setup is a more civilizational issue rather than only uh, saying ourselves in terms of setting ourselves uh, in terms of seeing uh, that uh, uh, that there is a world class university and why i say that uh, that if you typically look at uh, the world class university we always talk about a either a ranking or ranking again goes into a times or or or, or a qs ranking uh, then if you look at the second point is in terms of mobility of students uh, now i would want to spend both a little bit of time so see a ranking there is a shift happening both ranking put together you see the uh, you know the decline of all the uh, you know developed country uh, the, the university rankings are going down typically if you talk about us uk etc both the rankings you look at country like china the rankings going up so there is a movement happening and that's why i say it's a civilizational issue china decided to do something 30 years back which i think india needs to do it now to make sure that civilization impact gets really augmented that's one second in terms of mobility if you look at uh, uh, roughly about 10 million students mobile internationally right and if you break that down large part of that go to us and uk right now china is inching now if you look at further china inside you look at country like korea and the other countries playing a very important korea japan 60% of chinese students are from asia right so these are country like korea these are country like uh, uh, you know all asian countries uh, including india so there are a lot of indian students go for an mbbs courses there our medical prices are very high so they go for a cheaper medical degrees there in china so there is a china in, in inching and why i say that it is a civilizational issue in both ranking and also mobility that needs to shift today if you look at india where is the student in terms of mobility in india comes in large part of that from nepal neighboring countries look at china's uh, where is coming from south korea's per capita income is about $50000 china's per, nepal's per capita income of $1500 look at in terms of funding modeling happening there that plays an important role so how would you look at both of this as an important way to say that you shift there so what do you do on the ranking side what do you do on the mobility side that's a question which i think we'll have to collectively address but more important for us that what's the character of india what's our strength we don't we don't want to play on somebody else's strength there was a time in the us played private university very important role based on endowment which was happening in harvard and stanford's world that shifted to tsinghua in china which is actually changing to become the largest or the best university of the world citations are the one percent on those research aspects so why that shift happening because there's a huge amount of public funding went into stingwa which i think is a model which we need to figure out for us is there a funding is there a endowment or is a public funding having said that i would actually further come down and say that what is it for india which really would work and what is it which we should really be thinking in terms of our distinct identity and i'm going to use few minutes there to just to uh, chart that out i think we are a english speaking country there's a rhetoric happenings that you are a diverse country many languages the fact of the matter is that we are the largest english speaking country that's your strength give it or take it it's your strength right your communication with the world is very clear one on one right it's not through a communicator we've seen a viral video right now which say there is a communicator who's communicating with the third party the two two worlds best leaders there is a gap there you have english who you speak and you it's a clear communication that's your strength the second important the democracy uh, and i'm uh, that's your strength democracy is really where the larger part of the population lies that's your strength it its kpo bpo has been a core of your service industry that's your strength uh, so that's uh, if you list all of this strength and then start charting out of your plan as to how do you really look at those mobility and the ranking issue to be addressed is really a question for us to then start impacting the funding modeling the research impact the mobility of faculties and the students and i think there are university already doing that private university like manipal symbiosis are actually setting those kind of benchmark i think we need to see it from a near to far strategy that's my last point near to far strategy near strategy right now far strategy is to really look at your narrative for the building of nalandas and bikram silas of the world tomorrow but that's your mission but the vision right now or that's a, that's a vision of yours the mission right now is to be able to get your strengths play for you
get your English speaking milieu play for you, get your ITITS play for you, get your democracy play for you, get all of that play for you and get that to help, help in terms of ranking and mobility uh, help becoming better, you can start setting up a few examples of those uh, world class universities. Thank you everybody, I think, uh, thank you Ratnesh. Uh, it's been a good warm up question of SARTS. Uh, I've got some points which, uh, which we will discuss further. But I'm also conscious of the fact that uh, there are two more panels that are going to happen after this. One on partnerships and collaborations and one on research. So maybe those are the, we should leave discussions on those points for those panels to come up with and, and really expect some good outcome from there. But from our uh, panel perspective, uh, let me reiterate. We are discussing developing world-class universities, the imperatives, which means the now, the today, and what is it that we need to do now, which will set us apart and which will differentiate, as Dr. Anya said. So, in light of that, can we have a quick round in terms of, uh, and view of views on, is it differentiation or is it ranking that is going to really take us and, and create the world-class university. We'll start with Dr. Ananya, you, because you coined the word differentiation, and then I think we'll go to... Uh. I was dreading that I would be the first one asked to answer that question. So I would say either or. Um, I mean, I don't want to suggest that we are so weak that we are should not be looking at ourselves in ranking. Ranking is a mirror. Let's put it, put, it, put it in front of us and see what it shows. There's no harm in learning about yourself in terms of a benchmark. But that should not make us shy away or take away our confidence to define our distinctiveness. So whether it's English speaking, whether it's our democracy, I would say my, you know, as I said, coming from outside after 27 years, what is, I think, our great distinctive strength is the aspiration of our youth right now, which is um, visible across class, social uh, cleavage, uh, gender, all kinds of diversity. That aspiration of our youth, which is absolutely ready to defy barriers, that is our greatest strength. Um, I recently heard Harvard professor Raj Chetty, who, who has this theory of how many Einsteins the US has lost because its innovation is coming only from the most elite universities and there's no ecosystem of innovation. And he says that when we actually, if we actually could reach out to all postal codes where all kinds of people live, the number of Einsteins, the number of innovations in the US would quadruple. And I think India is already showing that. So I find that universities, uh, to, um, as I was saying, empowering this youth, creating, uh, really finding pathways to mobilize that aspiration, which is happening through the innovation centers, through basic uh, research, through applied research. Those are our strengths. And the, the impact that we, we would create on research areas like climate change, like energy, like diversity and inclusion, like questions of electoral politics, I think those are world-leading knowledge impact that we can create. Uh, the, se the other thing I would say about, you know, distinction versus ranking, one thing we need to do here and now as an imperative is to absolutely have foreign students and faculty from anywhere in the world come to India. And it may not be in the beginning in degree programs. That take up may be slow. But there can be courses, there can be immersions, there can be summer schools. The pathways of where collaboration can happen and what India, in which ways the Indian um, uh, research impact is distinctive, that needs to be shown to the world ASAP. And we need to learn from what is happening in different parts of the world. And it, that has to be an imperative, not only the numbers of students in degrees or number of students in graduate programs. And I'll maybe stop there. No, I think that's a great point. I think, um, uh, is, there, is there anyone in the panel who wants to add or who wants to 
bring a different perspective. Amitabh, maybe you, you, you started the ranking uh, uh, you know, question. Would you want to jump in and let me put you on the spot? Yeah, I mean, no, I think, I mean, completely agree. I think it's uh, not an either or uh, at all, Ravi. In fact, if you look at it, uh, institutions can build distinctiveness much faster than they could get to rankings, right? So, distinctiveness is in your, is in within, fully within the control of an institution. I think they must, every institution must do it and it should eventually converge with, with the rankings. I think you have to understand who your audience is. So, I think if you're, I mean, you know, not if, but for an international audience, you cannot escape rankings because students, stakeholders, you know, various intermediaries, whatever you want, you know, they will all make decisions based on ranking. So, rankings is the eventual goal, but I think we probably need to make sure that that does not become the only goal. So, distinctiveness and, you know, being able to, it comes first. I think there's a lot of outcomes, including graduate outcomes, that you can deliver much faster. So, if you run a two-year program, your first cohort graduates in two years. So, if you do a fantastic job with that first cohort, you've got your evidence there. Your rankings will need you, maybe will take you five years more to get there. So, I think this is, it's not an either or, and I I think uh, the third important point I would just say on rankings is again it's important to unpack the rankings because there are certain elements which are just structurally long term including research I mean I think you know great research takes a lot of time to do I'm not I'm not a researcher I don't have anywhere close to the kind of experience that others on this panel have with research but I do know that it's uh, it takes time uh, and you know you know it, it doesn't happen overnight uh, so I think it's important to again unpack some of those uh, um, you know, you know, uh, 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 you know, metrics within rankings, and focus on those, um, and 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 at least um, you know uh, ensure that those are being achieved. So I think that's probably you know just just uh, you know kind of my, uh, what I'd like to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Amitabh. I think I think we all agree to a certain extent that maybe both should both are important, but uh, differentiation or distinction. Uh, where do we start? Is it a marketing story or is it a, uh, you know, understanding your strength and building on your strength and then showing it to the world? Or is it just about, you know, India's best kept secret that nobody knows much about it and therefore uh, nobody cares? Okay, I'll start with you, Ratnesh, and then I'll go to Dr. Chen because... I think, uh, Ravi, the... Uh the tsunami what we see in the startup world in India and the model which is created uh, in now is actually going as a model outside, whether it's UPI and other example which we look at. Uh, so I think if it is in higher education or university need to get that or bring that tsunami inside the campus, I, one of the important things which we need to do is to start playing on a, our strength, both the diversity as well as the younger population to imagine and get up with more ideas. Now, uh, I think combining both of that and getting our model right to get that energy, like the way we've done it in the startup uh, world in different parts of the country, is actually going, going to be a distinctly different story for India. So I think uh, clearly on an innovation index, we have jumped many fold. And that's just not a sheer number. It is an actual work happened in the last many years. I think if that's just really the tsunami coming and saying that there are output indicators are really making that difference, the input where the universities and the colleges come in need to bring that inside the campus and make sure that the funding model really gets right, whether through your own set of structure or in a very active engagement with the government to make sure that that model really starts pushing energy. No, I think we'll come to the funding and the infra model in a bit. Dr. Chen, uh, Dr. Chen, your perspectives in terms of, uh, you've heard us, how do you define or how do you distinguish differentiation, distinction. What has Taiwan done to... Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, Taiwan, uh, we still consider the world uh, uh, rankings, you know, is an uh, uh, objective system that uh, that we have to, you know, uh, uh, follow and pursue, yeah. And this is uh, also a problem that in the past uh, uh, five, ten years, uh, many universities in Taiwan try, try to achieve a higher uh, 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 ranking, uh, you know, in uh, world, uh, in various uh, indexes. But, of course, at uh, um, we know that uh, uh, there is no uh, object uh, way of uh, evaluating a uh, you know, performance of the universities, uh, particularly uh, in, in Taiwan that uh, we are not uh, 
uh, English speaking society. Yeah. So a lot of uh, academic performances that we do, uh, it, it cannot be, you know, uh, uh, evaluated, you know, in the Western standards. Yeah. And so I think that in, in recent years, uh, we try to, uh, many universities, including mine, um, uh, we try to find a balance. That is, uh, of course, that uh, 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 your uh, research uh, performance important, you know, for you to get a higher ranking uh, yeah, in the world. But of course, uh, that uh, you also have to uh, 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 find a way that is uh, that is at least uh, 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 in your society. That is, uh, uh, what do people really think? You are a really good university, uh, and you make contributions to the society. That is more important than uh, get. Uh, 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 recognition by by other countries. That's my answer. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think uh, the question still remains. I think we are we probably are aligned to the fact that uh, ranking is probably the outcome, you know, which will happen over a period of time. But there are certain imperatives that we need to do right now. Uh, I saw a vigorous shake of head when I talked about marketing and when I talked about branding. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute, but we are also aligned in the fact that there is a need to differentiate. There is a need to play up our strength and, and create something. So what are the two things that we need to do today if when India sets up its world-class universities or goes about setting it up as time unfolds, unfolds, what are the two things that we can build on? And what are the two things that we can really uh, you know, expect FIKI or some of our the influencing organizations to influence the, the government of India to kind of take it from there? So what are those two initiatives that, or what are those two areas and what are those two initiatives that we can all agree to, or not agree to, at least discuss? I don't think it's going to, we are going to agree in 30 minutes, but at least discuss and figure out what is the way forward. Uh, I'll start this time with uh, Ratnish, you first, and then I'll go down. I think uh, I would keep going back to the same point. Uh, 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 clearly, the uh, uh, our strength of diversity, our strength of younger population, our strength of technology is actually huge. And I think the models which are coming around in terms of new startup and the ones uh, which are really emerging is uh, clearly defining the way the world should shape up, whether on the uh, uh, carbon footprinting, sustainability, or a new energy, or, or the UPI, uh, uh, the, the whole financing model, or the finance model, how does the Fed bank and the banking would work. All that structure is a new uh, structure which is coming out of the co same college going students and the same university students then coming out and setting up. I think the way to look at it from a near to far strategy, far is where the ranking has to work, whether it's a QS or some other kind of a ranking. But the near strategy is to play on that strength to bring this startup culture inside the university and colleges and start getting all that model seated inside. So if it is uniquely energy institution, figure out all of the kinds of energy models working or if uniquely a finance institution all kinds I used to work in Citibank and we never imagined that one day there's a pay you and Paytm is going to happen and now we regret thinking about it that why did we not at that point in time decided to do that so today is a time to bring the new startups inside the campus and start modeling them as part of your curriculum and distinctly create your own identity as an institution that you solve this problem while startup was solving that problem also for the universe. Yeah, I think uh, Ratesh is sticking to the point on entrepreneurship, uh, you know, uh, building, uh, build it around entrepreneurship. I think I'll probably extend it to say a digital entrepreneurship because, I mean, I'm, the India IT story is probably well established. So I think you're referring to edtech and digital uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, Amita, before I go to Dr. Ananya, what is, how do you see this, this area playing out in terms of India taking a pole position and working on digital entrepreneurship? Uh, okay, well, um, I, 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 I want to, uh, as, okay, because I'm, I'm working here as a foreigner, and, uh, uh, but I'm also an educator uh, that I've uh, been teaching in universities for many years. My, my observation is that I think that uh, uh, in terms of the education, India should be more open and more international. Um, f uh, that, uh, I that, that I mean that uh, um, particularly uh, research and uh, academic cooperation with uh, with other uh, universities in other countries, 
uh, I think that is uh, is is a must. That is uh, that means that uh, Indian universities uh, should try to explore the uh, all uh, possibilities uh, of uh, of this kind of program with other universities. And so far, that uh, joint degree or double degree programs in India is very very rare. Yeah, only a few universities are allowed to do that. But uh, uh, in Taiwan, that uh, we have a lot of collaboration with American and European universities. So a PhD student right now they don't st they don't spend a whole you know five six years in one place. They take class they take courses in one country. They go to the lab in another country and then present their research in, in a third country. I did. I think this is a trend. And uh, India is such a huge country and uh, and with uh, so many universities and a huge potential. You should be more open and encourage more international collaboration with other uh, prominent uh, or universities around the world. That's my advice. Thank you. Amitabh? Yeah, and uh, I mean, I'll come to the point on digital entrepreneurship, but I think going back to your original question, Ravi, of what do institutions need to do? I mean, I think, look, uh, every institution needs to have a clear vision around who they want, you know, who they want to be, uh, which goes back to the point about, you know, a differentiation, distinctiveness. And I think that vision needs to drive, um, you know, everything that the institution does. Um, and of course, it will also chalk out, you know, or somewhere converge with rankings and you know, you know, over a period of time. So I think I think that that vision is obviously key. I think as you build the vision, as you especially as you build your differentiation, I think it is very very important to leverage your strengths. And I think you know there is absolutely no doubt uh, in my mind, you know, about you know. I think all of the panelists have very clearly said that. Look, India is an exciting place, um, you know, uh, in terms of the in the innovation that's happening across different industry segments, right? So whether whether it's digital, whether it is low, and especially low cost, high scale, high impact, um, you know, type platforms, whether it's payments, whether it's education, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, retail, whether it's now more and more EV and sustainability. I mean, I think there is just so much going on. And, and I think we all need to be balanced about also, um, you know, what constitutes innovation. I mean, today we should all be open that, look, um, you know, high scale, low cost manufacturing is also innovation. Right, we don't always need to, um, you know, discover, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 you know, the drug that's going to save the world. I mean, there is, I think, a lot of value in also uh, just commercializing and maybe, you know, growing existing pieces. So I think the the differentiation, the positioning, must be built on all of the wonderful innovation that's happening within, um, you know, the Indian ecosystem. And I would not call out industry only. There is society, and of course, um, you know, there is government. I would say, uh, which are all equal part so I think that's the second part which should be looking which we should use to build uh, you know that differentiation I think it's also very important for us to do so as a country because I think that will give us an edge which others do not I mean we cannot uh, practically profess to be to have a large number of very high ranked global globally ranked institutions at least in the near term so I think we anyway have to find that angle we have to find that edge which would make us stand apart and I think that's clearly um, you know the the, the the, the innovation, um, you know, ecosystem that exists in India, and then two important levers to, I think, um, you know, just execute on that. One is uh, which will support the realization of this vision. One is, you know, very very high quality and world class governance and leadership, which will ensure that you know each of these elements of distinctive, distinctiveness, differentiation, and excellence actually get internalized and delivered across, you know, the spectrum of activities and what needs to be done. And and then I think the second important aspect would be, I think, going back to becoming much more open um, in engaging and interacting with the world much more effectively, but perhaps doing so by using existing models that partner institutions already have in place. I don't think we as a country, we as a system currently have the time or maybe even the capacity to build models. I think we must enter into partnerships with international institutions, with universities, and try to at least um, you know maybe leverage existing models and obviously provide a lot more of the content that would uh, you know is relevant to us so I would say those would be my two almost um, you know the how part of it uh, you know to, to be able to um, you know make progress uh, you know on this front no I think uh, 
<laughs> good points. I think, like I said, we'll we'll we will. There's a panel on global, equitable global partnerships, and I'm sure they'll they'll deliberate upon it. But coming back to you, Dr. Ananya, two questions for you. I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. The first question is. Uh, if you take, let's say we take digital entrepreneurship as a differentiator, which I think, okay. Do you think there are other differentiators? This is on the tech and the STEM field. Uh, yeah, are there other differentiators on the, uh, yeah, on the lib arts piece or where we can really call it out? And uh, those could be some areas we can start. That's number one. And uh, what is wrong with? Uh, telling the India story. <laughs> What's wrong with marketing? <laughs> Nothing at all. I just wanted to, exp in fact, I was going to, when you asked what can Fiki do, I was actually going to make that pitch. The, what I was saying no to is that the exercise of defining our distinctiveness is not entirely just a marketing story. We have to, with confidence, say that th we are distinctive in this way. And then we need everybody, Fiki, the government, you know, all. Uh, society, as we said, to actually help us uh, uh, display that to the world. Universities alone cannot tell their story by themselves, even with their own marketing teams. That's not the marketing that will help us get there. This has to be a mission if I can put it that way, that these are our distinctive strengths. Please come and participate in these distinctive areas. It has to be a national, social, educational mission for everybody to take. I wanted to respond to Dr. Chen. So as an institution of eminence, we do have the freedom to develop all kinds of curriculum. To all my partners, global partners here, we very much would welcome partnerships. And again, I'm repeating this point. So yes, of course, our students and our faculty will go abroad. But I am extremely interested in having cohorts of your students from all over the world come to India. And uh, in terms of strength, I'll go to humanities in a minute, humanities and liberal arts. But one thing I want to say, India has a certain distinctiveness which we don't acknowledge. We are great at structured learning. We, get, we teach our students great foundation at school. We are not so good at the other part of it, which is creativity in uh, expression or you know, uh, out of the box thinking at the school or the university level. But it's coming slowly. But what we can offer to the world is pedagogy, pedagogical innovations, which combine this structured learning, strong foundation with creativity with innovation and now with all of the technology the AR VR and all of the technology that can help us with pedagogy India is in a position to create absolutely unique immersive pedagogies in every discipline possible uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating it's already happening in science it can happen in history it can happen in the humanities it can happen in cultural studies there's no field where we cannot gain from these particular kinds of ped pedagogies. So I am uh, in economics, of course. I, some would not consider that as humanities, but of course in the humanities and social sciences field, there is enormous uh, capability in India. You know, economists, there's not a single economics department in any university in the world where there is no Indian. It's just, I don't know every, but it would be very hard pressed to find an economics department where there isn't an Indian. And the uh, way um, Indian economists are influencing the thinking, about, not only about India, thinking about economics, we all know that. Right, but uh, we, we need to then. I mean, uh, uh, the teaching about it, the tradition of teaching e economics in India is very strong, but it's a strength that we certainly, economics, social science, liberal arts, certainly is a strength that we can play to. Uh, cultural, you know, culture and humanities is come back in a big way, even in the thinking of employers. There are so many, I don't know if you've seen the uh, TEDx talk about philosophers at Google. 
And there's very clear thinking that now with AI, with technology, the humanity is part of it, an inter uh, intercultural understanding, understanding of diversity is extremely important. And India should absolutely take leadership not only in that we are a diverse society, but in actually developing transdisciplinary curriculum which teach these things with competencies like intercultural understanding, which is so important right now. So I could go on, as you can tell, <laughs> but, um, but universities have to decide on one or two areas and then develop them. We can't be distinctive in everything, obviously. And that's a task, that's the inward task after which marketing, branding, and everybody else has to take it on as a mission. Thanks, Dr. Nani. I think uh, just you want to make a quick point. I want to switch switch tracks. So just uh, make a point. No, no, I think uh, add to the point what uh, ma'am you were making uh, is that the mobility is largely the mobility number which I talked about largely around the STEM and science. There's been a little on the liberal arts and the I think the opportunity for us to do well. But the point which I was making a very quick one is that I initially started by saying that for India it is a civilizational issue. And why I said that uh, that the, the thrust and the force it clearly indicates that the, it's going to be decayed for a Asia and India would play an important role. The distinct value proposition for India, and I think that's the point which differentiation as well, is the our ability. So the way the world is that it's a consuming world, developed world, consumed a lot, not ready to acknowledge. Energy uh, shifting is not happening. The developed world is not making statements in many of these forums like G20. Uh, developing uh, countries are actually s pushing them to make those statements. The point for India today is to say, and that's the uh, that's for the university to also look at in terms of uh, seeing that that can impact the ranking as well. Is there a way that we can actually s leverage the strength of our uh, low price, high uh, quality? Uh, and I think that is, uh, is there a way that low price, high quality can pr produce a better yield in terms of uh, research, ranking, citations, uh, uh, you know, and, and if we can actually have that model inside the university of ensuring that those are also impacted the research space, clearly we'll have a distinct space both in liberal arts and the STEAM space to tell the world that here is a country offers the same quality at a very price which is affordable and we are away from a consuming world to more affordable world. That's the shift happening in the world. Uh, thanks, Ritnish, but I, I don't think it's an economic uh, price discussion, commercial discussion as yet. I think it's more strategic in nature. So switching tracks, uh, NEP 2020, provides a lot of latitude to do some of these things, right? So that's, that's part one. Part two is, as, as Amitabh said, uh, it's all about innovation, right? India has always been at the core of innovation, right? From mathematics, if you go back, uh, you know, we've done everything in this architecture or whatever. So if you were to combine innovation, and if you were to combine or our innovative spirits, and if you were to kind of look at what NEP offers in terms of the latitude and the liberties, what are the two or three things, three things that a world-class university should do to make sure that these objectives are met? And I'm going to start, Amitabh, with you first, because we've been part of the EY paper, so if you can come in first and then I'll go to Dr. Ananya. If I, I mean, to, I guess if I take the NEP, and I mean, obviously, I mean, there's, you know, just just so many great institutions in our countries which are already doing great work. So I mean, this is by no means, uh, you know, NEP who needs you to do this. But I think if I think about NEP, there's two clear, um, I think, points of emphasis within the NEP which I think every higher educational institution must embrace. One, digital, right? Every higher educational institution needs to become more digital because that will, and, 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 and I say that because that will in turn allow institutions to improve experience for both students and faculty. It will allow institutions to really expand their networks beyond the physical boundaries of their campus or even their city or country. And it will also allow institutions to serve a significantly larger number of students through, you know, 
programs, shorter programs, and as as um, uh, you know, Ananya mentioned, you know, it doesn't have to be a degree program; could be um, you know, shorter term programs. So I think digital, which is you know one big part of what NEP is trying to guide uh, towards, would be one important aspect. And then I think the second big pillar or placeholder, which I would call out, would be internationalization. And again, you know, whether it is um, you know uh, to the point uh, Dr. Chen made about you know being more open and being more active, being more engaged with international uh, partnerships, whether it is being able, you know, being more open and being more receptive to and may, maybe more ambitious around international students. I mean, I would personally think that India and Indian institutions underwhelm themselves in the global landscape, right? I think we just, maybe either we're getting over, over, over influenced by rankings or I don't know what it is, but I think there is, you know, a, you know head to head, um, you know, the, the six million or seven million students that Ratnesh referred to go to far lower quality institutions than I think uh, in India attract. So I think there is definitely upside there. So I think internationalization and digital would be the two pillars on which I think every institution must really focus on as they think about their next five years, 10 years, 15 years to strategic plans, their vision, uh, who they want to be. Thanks, Amita. Dr. Anand. So a couple of things. One is uh, connecting to the uh, NEP, a multidisciplinary curriculum. We have to break through uh, boundaries, silos in curriculum. And in Achivnagar, we already have something we call the common core curriculum, which every student, whatever they study, have to take. And these come from, go from philosophy to coding to environment, whatever. But here we also need the understanding of industry and broader society of the value of this education, that we are producing more empowered, holistically trained, uh, more competent individuals who will serve your organizations better and serve society better. That's number one. Number two is research. So of course by research we always think about the infrastructure, the personnel, the investment, etc. But research is fundamentally a habit of the mind. Whatever discipline you study, whether you go into a lab or you're in your car, if I've taught you to ask questions, to find answers, to look for where gaps in knowledge is, that is what research is. And we need to build that into our students from day one. And what universities need to showcase, along with the citation score and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is how did we teach our students to become those individuals who are always guided by research. And when they're worried about all their jobs going away, that quality, that competence, is always going to serve them across societies, across. So whether we become more digital, whether we become more entrepreneurial, the ability to find gaps, identify solutions, identify strategies, ask questions, that's a fundamental quality we need in all our citizens. So universities really have to think research in a very broad, substantive, introspective, and fundamental way. And I would think that, you know, we talked about how India can produce world quality, world class in lower cost. This would be one way to producing a research mindset irrespective of how many rupees or dollars are spent in the labs, in building the labs. And this is something we absolutely have to do from the university in the remotest area of the country to the privileged universities in different parts of the country. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Anani. I think 30 seconds from each one of you. I'm just going to put all of you on this part. World-class university should focus on A, degree, or B, competency, and innovation. So A is degree, B is competency, innovation. Um, let's go, let's start with you, Ratnesh. Just, just just give me what what your 30 seconds are. Yeah, so degree is important. Uh, competency is living today in the sense that you cannot live in this world, uh, which is where the power shift is happening only with the. 
I would tilt more towards competency and ability to ask questions the way Ananya was actually uh, idiotic. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to make a choice because students need the degree to find a job. We haven't changed that reality for them. So I can't say no degree. So all three plus empowerment, the confidence to change and impact the future. All four. <laughs> Dr. Chen? Yeah, I, I also think all three are important. That, uh, yeah, that uh, but you have to keep a balance, you know, because at the different universities uh, has uh, its own, you know, like uh, strengths and uh, also its own strategies. I think that uh, 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 they should try to find their own strategy and uh, keep uh, balance among the three goals you just mentioned. I, actually, I want to say a little bit about uh, the, the digital earlier that uh, you mentioned. That is, just give me 30 seconds. Because that I think that uh, right now, the uh, that uh, for all students uh, and also the, for all, all scholars, uh, the, uh, the biggest challenge and also uh, most important thing is that accessibility to data and information. And compared to 30, 40 years ago when we studied, that uh, the only way to, to, to get knowledge is to buy books. But right now everything is online, particularly for a big country like India, you know, like uh, uh, in a vast campus in a very remote area. I think that uh, how students and scholars have access to, to data information. So I think that the internet and also uh, digitalization of the of the library and also the, the database, I think is a, is crucial. And then if you can do that, so you can attract more international scholars and students to come to India. That's my advice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Amitabh, 30 seconds. Yeah, I mean, I think the degree is a given because you're talking about university. So I don't think, that, I, mean, I mean, that's, yeah, it's, I don't think that's, there's any choice there. But I think clearly after that, I think it's competency and skill. Uh, and specifically, I think as uh, the point was made, curiosity and learning to learn. Being lifelong learners, I think those are the two skills I think that would ensure success in whatever you do. So clearly competency and skill would be where I would um, sort of definitely focus significantly and then, you know, um, you know, lifelong learning or becoming lifelong learners or, curio you know, and building curiosity, inquisitiveness, research mindset, those are the actual sort of, I would say, descriptors of those skills. Thanks, Amitabh. I think it's been a, it's been a great panel. It's been a, uh, you know, some of the questions were on the fly and I kind of made it up as we, as we spoke. Uh, so thanks, thanks for the, the, thanks for the answers. I think to me, if I were to quickly put this in two sentences, uh, maybe the imperatives for world-class universities in the light of NEP 2020 and India's 2047 vision as we move towards that. Uh, I think what, what as a panel, what we are agreeing to is that there's of course a need to leverage the NEP 2020 liberties and uh, all that we can do with that. There's also a, a clear, uh, you know, focus on competency building, uh, on on innovation. Uh, there's also a, uh, there's there's also empowerment we talked about. Uh, but more, more than anything else, I think uh, it's to pick those two or three areas or two or three strengths of in inherent core strengths of India, which the university then needs to develop and then needs to take it out as brand India or market or whatever. And being a consummate sales and marketing person all my life, uh, <laughs> I cannot take anything against marketing. Uh, so I think the story has to be told. The story has to be told in a way that attracts more students, attracts more faculty to come in. And obviously this, this, this will enable better global partnerships and will enable research and will benefit research in a very large way. The two topics which we did not cover in detail because in deference to the subsequent panels that will that'll happen after this. But having said all of this, I think uh, all of us are very clear that the time to act is now. And I think uh, we cannot wait for anybody else to tell us what we need to do. Uh, we know what to do. We know what to pick. It's all about creating it putting innovation into that and probably then taking it out and telling the world that India is ready. This is Advantage India. Thank you very much. There are five minutes. Uh, we can take a couple of questions. Thank you, a lovely discussion. I'm Mohan Rao. I have a different question in terms of uh, the NEP 2020 talks of clustering. 
the credit transfer system. Now, having done it individually all these years and not achieved, can't we have a collaborative model at least to start with for some years? We're looking at government funding and all that. Is that thought right to be in the space in the global universities? Dr. Anne, would you like to answer? Anybody can. I mean. uh, can you repeat the last part of it? I was just saying, can we have the clustering approach by which we work as clusters? See, when you look at, I am in uh, management, some in science, we can collaborate, do collaborative research, right? Get into the space and then strive individually. Because we have strived all these years individually, not achieved. But I think before I give it to Dr. Ananya, she, she would like to make a point. I think, it's, I think the intent is always to have cross-functional research, cross-functional competencies, because uh, I believe even the IIMs are now looking at uh, uh, reserving a set of uh, seats for people with a humanities and you know co uh, different kind of backgrounds because still it's different yeah. as collaborators as cl colleges together as universities together i don't mean within a university across yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. I think this was, you know, this is very common in many countries that you have a credit transfer agreement between collaborating institutions, and so each each student does not have to be assessed every time. Absolutely, that is possible. I don't know. We ha we have not yet uh, thought about collaborating with other institutions, but we absolutely have a lateral admissions policy, which is exactly this. That if I, I meant research, 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 research collaborations are happening. It is just not as structured as it should be, but they are absolutely happening. Yeah. No, I, I think the, I mean the, obviously the fine print is yet to be released, but I think the eventual objective is to actually convert these for collaborations into a more formal structure. So I think the one of the objectives is to take a lot of individual institutions and put them into a single larger unit that works as a single entity. So I think the direction of travel is very much that and I think in fact the desire is to convert these loser collaborative arrangements into a much more hardwired, structured, in, you know, operation, organizational uh, and operational model. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I have time only for maybe one or two questions. Uh, I saw Shovik raising his hand. Shovik, can you just? Thank you. Uh, Shovik Vadajariya, Bits Filani. Uh, I'm not very hopeful uh, uh, about, uh, you know, international faculty and international students in, in great numbers uh, moving into India. We've been talking about it. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, barriers to that. Um, I see one uh, hopeful area which is emerging. Um, it's a, I don't think we have talked about it. Indian startups uh, which start in our hostels, in our dorms, and they are operating completely in, in uh, USA, typically. Uh, this is a new area, and, and there are quite a few. Uh, if you take statistics, and they're extremely successful, deep tech startups, hardware startups. I'm not just talking about software parts. This is an area which is going to uh, emerge, and if we nurture it, we do it with uh, good care, this is an area where we would be doing well. India has to do it differently compared to the classic definitions of world-class universities. As, as all of you have emphasized, we have unique, distinct strengths, and we've got to play well. The, the playbook has got to be different, not the classic one you have. Thanks, Dr. Shovik. I think that's very interesting. So you have a point. I just had one quick point, I think, to the first point Dr. Bhattacharya made, which was on faculty, international faculty, I mean, whatever happens. But I think maybe, and Fiki, maybe as recommendations, India should maybe borrow a leaf out of some of the Middle East countries who actually came up with a national scholarship program, sent students to the US, UK, wherever, to essentially obtain a foreign education and come back and contribute to the um, workforce and to the industrial and economic agenda. So I think the Indian government government should actually think about some kind of a scholarship program where we send, uh, you know, we sponsor, we, we fund uh, students to go out and do their PhD and come back hopefully. I mean, I'm just saying that's that's clearly one, you know, change that we need to bring and maybe that's a that's a recommendation, uh, Ravi, that we should actually be providing to the government. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thanks everybody. We have completely out of time. Ten seconds left. Thanks Ratnesh. Thanks Dr. Ananya. Thanks Dr. Chen. Thanks Amitabh. I think it's been a great, love, lively debate and I hope we'll, there'll be some takeaways and Fiki will work on it and we'll see where this goes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, sir.
And ladies and gentlemen, that was a wonderful session, interactive session we had. And we now close the proceedings and we now have the tea break. The tea and coffee is being served in the food hangar. The next session will commence at 12.15. We request you all to be seated back in time for the next session, which is on the topic of... <coughs>